Hey friends, I wanted to bring you a throwback episode so you could see from perspective the changes that have happened in a year. This is an interview I did with my friend and proofreader Shane Simonson. Shane Simonson. If you've ever watched an author read in public and felt bored, TRBM is the antidote. TRBM is for writers what time-lapse was for painters. Guitar solos and spotlights were for bands. What chainsaws and ice blocks were for sculptors. What does TRBM stand for? Telepathic Razorback Boar Mutiny? Tortured Rebecca Believes Master? Taxable Remuneration by Marxists? You decide. Oh, but once they show that something's possible, it's just a matter of adapting yes. it for your own purposes. And right. they've definitely been a model for me. But um, yeah. I, I followed their advice that, particularly with Kickstarters, it's not something that a, a starting author can necessarily pull off easily. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something that you transition to as quickly as possible to kind of take control of the process and escape yeah. the algorithms. Yeah. Um, and then, so one of my questions for you is I, I was looking at all of your cover, cover art. I, I guess I have a host of questions, but your cover mm-hmm. art is so consistent and so captivating and interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. how, how did you design it? Uh, so it was a long process. I, I talked to, um, JD, uh, DJ Bowman Smith recently about this. Oh, wow. I, I okay. I didn't realize her. you know DJ. What a small uh, well, world. I, 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 I name dropped you to like ah, get my foot good. in the door, but she she's lovely. She's just me, wonderful. So, um, so originally uh, with the covers, I was like, do I go to a professional artist? And it's like, how do I even explain what I want? Because I'm doing purely biological science fiction, which doesn't exist. There's no existing mm. visual language that I can just tap into and say, I'll just make it like, you know, yeah. XYZ books that have come before. Right. Um, and I don't have any Photoshop skills and that would have been a really long journey. And I'm a bit allergic to Photoshop. Like every cover, pretty much every cover is Photoshop. And I'm like, I I think I can do something different. Mm -hmm. Um, I tried doing macro photography of like little tiny dioramas of like living things and textures. And I could see that it would work, but I didn't have a photography background. So that would have been a big learning curve as well. And then I remembered, oh, I used to use Adobe Illustrator all the time when I did scientific diagrams when I was working as a research scientist. So I already had like a, you know, a year's head start on the basics there. And it's like, well, I really love that era of uh, abstract Mm -hmm. uh, sci-fi covers kind of in the 60s and 70s. Like some of the most iconic covers are from that period in time. Yeah. And uh, I I basically just gathered together um, biological imagery Mm -hmm. uh, because my target audience are people who love biology. So Mm -hmm. I just have to like tap into those motifs to kind of signal to them, oh, it's all sorts of interesting biology in this book. And then I just went through a long very long process of putting together a design, putting it aside while I worked on another draft for a while and coming back to it and allowing it time to breathe. Mm. Doing lots of A-B testing on social okay. media really helped as well too. Wow. Um, you give people a blurb to read and they're like, oh, that's mm-hmm. too long. I've, I've, I've got you know other things to do. But yes. if you give them two images and say, which yes. one do you like more? You get yeah. an amazing response. Um, people yeah. just love that kind of thing. And I basically yeah. just whittled, whittled, whittled my way along picking the better of the two options and then tinkering with it and repeating the process. Yeah. That's what you're saying is especially true of Twitter. Um, people, people eat up. Um, I mean, like if it can fit in one tweet. It's good. People keep telling me that Twitter is good. If you do a tweet storm or a tweet thread, I literally have had no success on any kind of tweet storm or tweet thread. Every time I can contain my thoughts to one single tweet, people seem to have enough energy to really engage and you can start longer Mm. conversations that way. Um, Mm. I started doing a version of AB testing recently for taglines for my book and people have been absurdly helpful. Like, Mm. You you can pick out quickly what is working and what's not working by how engaged people are. And they're just, they have no issue expressing their opinions very forcefully. It's nice. Yes. Yep. So, okay. So you have your covers designed. Is there a book that's actually written corresponding to each one of those covers? Or do you know yes. that those books are going to be written? So they're all yeah, written. No, no, no. They're, they're, uh, they're drafted and they're in the end stages of editing at the moment. So okay. I'm aiming for an April release. So hopefully I haven't 
uh, cut myself off at the legs by giving myself a really short yeah. timeline. But yeah, are you uh, are you going to release all of them like simultaneously, or are you going to try to do like a rapid release? What's your plan? I'm aiming for rapid release. I'm thinking two weeks apart because they're wow. about okay. four, they're about forty thousand words, so they're long novella, short novel, kind of in that no man's land of length that yeah. mm-hmm. nobody quite knows what to call it. Um, but it's just the natural story form that just works for me. Like I, I, I get to forty thousand words, and I'm like, oh, that's yeah. exactly what I wanted to say. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, because Amazon seems to promote new releases for the first two weeks, I'm mm-hmm. hoping to kind of chain that through the four of them. Yes. Uh, Every, every little bit that you can do to like bow down to the algorithm seems to help. Yeah, it does. And I, you're going to do, I think you're going to do better than some people do because of the clear amount of energy you've put into cover design. I have to imagine that that translates into your, your editing process. You're not self-editing. I'm assuming, um, I guess <laughs> I shouldn't make assumptions. So I have had, this is one thing. So I'm on a very limited budget. I'm, I'm retired okay. very early. Uh, which yeah. means I have a huge amount of time, but very limited amount of funds. Um, yeah. I, I like to joke that we're upper lower class, that we like have no money, but we don't really need any more. Yeah. Um, living on a farm kind of helps with that. But mm-hmm. uh, so the plan is to at least get proofreading done on book one. Yeah. And based on how much they find, I can have a better sense of how delusional I'm being about whether sure. I can stuff out it. Because some, okay. some people seem to be able to. Um, and I'm quite prepared to go over it again and again and again. Um, yeah. But there's a there's diminishing returns on doing that yourself. I I Very fully much. understand that you eventually yeah. don't see the mistakes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, of the of the many beta the readers that I've sent them out to, a lot of people have commented that this, is this a draft? It's like unusually clean. That's so, good. Yeah. I, mm. And when I say self edit, that means I think you would be shocked how many books right now are on Amazon that have had no beta readers uh, mm. that somebody wrote and did a proofread on and mm-hmm. didn't spend the time. So one of the main things in editing, and I almost like sometimes I either want to just like link to other writing podcasts that discuss the process more because I have never really been interested in discussing it. But sometimes I get an itch to jump on and be like, hey, folks, when we talk about editing, we're not necessarily talking about proofreading. It's a separate, different thing yeah. that yeah. happens yeah. aside from editing. And there's so many people who think that all you do when you edit is make sure there's no spelling errors, no major grammatical issues. And I'm like, Absolutely. no, editing editing is cutting out the fluff and making sure that you don't have any third arm problems where, you know, you're like one second, somebody's hand is over here and then their <laughs> hand is here and now their hand is here and you're playing a game of Twister with nine nine yeah. different arms. So um, no, those I, kind of I, I love editing. working with critique partners um yeah. I've, I've read so many like full-length novels with people that i've shared the mm. process with and i just i love it so much I, it's funny yeah. I, I found it's really hard for me to read published like finished books because mm. i keep wanting to stop and like cross things out and like move things around like i That's love hilarious. that engaged process where wow. it, it, it's like a cat like once the mouse is dead mm-hmm. it loses all interest in like batting it around What is author marketing mastery through optimization, you ask? I'm gonna tell you, it's the best way for us authors to make a living selling our books. Are you tired of hearing gurus tell you your book is only good enough to be a lead magnet for services? Are you tired of feeling like you have to be a slave to social media and then frustrated when the time you spend doesn't actually help you sell books? I was too, until I found Ammo. Ammo is the only program that reliably produces results, and it works for anyone. Is it hard work? You bet. Do you have to overcome some of your own prejudices to make Ammo work for you? Absolutely. But rather than being another program that rah rah shish boss tries to get you emotionally excited only to offer unclear methods, Ammo shows you how to design profitable ads step by step through a unique, highly tested and targeted formula. The founder, Steve Piper, is a data-loving, formula-driven author who escaped the kingdom of Amazon to build a platform for himself, where he sold directly to his readers and built a loyal following and millions of copies sold. With Ammo, you know who's reading your books, how to contact them, and what they want to read next. If you've always been frustrated with Amazon's wall of mystery of not knowing who's reading your books and losing 50 to 70% of your hard-earned money that you're making through sales, Ammo solves all of those problems by putting you in the driver's seat. 
and showing you how to fulfill your books directly to your readership. Click the link in the show notes to learn more. Yes, um, that's, that's like me with writing. I love the process and the finished wow. product. Once it's done, I'm like, it's dead. I don't, I don't want to look anymore. Uh, one thing I've tapped into, I'm waiting for re- uh, feedback on this. Uh, there's a local reading group that mm-hmm. is currently reading my first novella. I printed them all up nicely and formatted them and sent them over and said, scribble all over them, uh, point out everything that, uh, that you notice. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's one way of doing like a, a larger scale kind of beta read all in one go that I don't think many yeah. people realize. Like there's, there's novel reading groups all over the place out there. And it's, uh, yeah. it's something a bit unusual to have a local author, uh, to, to give feedback to. Yeah. I I have always been somebody who has had a hard time with the the novel reading groups because I, I'm almost the opposite of you where there's something about my type A personality that I want to be able to track my reading stats. And so I really like things like Goodreads where I can say, I've started this book. I finished this book. This is my review <laughs> of the book. And when, when somebody offers me a book that's not published that I can't track, I'm like, well, then, you know, how will I be able to, you know? check it off the list. It's done. Uh, so that's, that's kind of led me down the road of, of paying for all of my edits and being more uh, oriented towards, towards trying to pay. Um, mm. There's some interesting things I think that happen. I, I really enjoy your uh, clear generosity, like something in you, either it's who you are as a human being or something in your life journey has, has kind of molded you that way. But from Mm -hmm. our very earliest interactions, when I didn't know you were you, uh, you've always been really generous. And that when somebody is that way, you're waiting for them to have an ulterior motive. You're waiting for them to be like, by the way, uh, Mm -hmm. And it just has never happened with you. And now you're talking about the writing groups and enjoying kind of that, that like shaping of the product. And I see in you something very generous. I guess, let me ask the the question that I'm assuming, are you a generous person or is it something life has taught you? Uh, oh, that's, that's a really interesting question to throw at someone. Um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, let me think. I'm trying to think. I, I tend to be generous both in support and criticism, I think would be a, a way to, to put mm-hmm. it. And depending on who you are and what moment you catch me in, you could probably have a very different impression on me yeah. about that, whether I'm a kind person in my generosity or not. But I mean, yeah. th- that's kind of the, the job of a, a writer too. It's not mm-hmm. all sunshine and roses. You have to be able right. to, to, to wade through the muck in life too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you and, and and this is a an industry where people will ask for favors all the time. So you become I think the longer you're in it, the longer you do start to build this sort of sense of like when is somebody gonna ask me for something? Um, mm. um well a good example of the kind of give and take that I've I've started to to I've heard people talk about and I've picked up on. Um I managed to get a short story, the first short story I put into a competition, into an anthology. Um Beautiful. it's the John Michael Greer uh, the flesh of your future clings between my teeth. Uh, it's a cli-fi parody anthology. It's like the, the craziest like subgenre that you can imagine. Um, so when I got a place and started uh, corresponding with the editor who was putting it together, um, I offered to have a go writing the blurb for the book. And editors are people who are run off their feet. Writing blurbs is a horrible thing that most people hate. I kind of love it. I love the oh. challenge of it. Wow. <laughs> um, like I've done them for a few writer friends who are like, and, wow. and I, I come up with titles for people as well. I love doing that too. Wow. I, I often wonder if I should have been in advertising because um, yeah. I, I, I thought about it when I was young, but I'm like, oh, it's too evil. I was like too ethical. And I'm like, no, I should have just been evil. Get it yeah. over and done with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I wrote the blurb for them. Um, I even came up with a few ideas for cover art that they didn't run with, but like it was mm. it was still a fun process. Um, yeah. And in return, uh, when I was putting my website together and I'm like, oh, what can I put up as like a reader magnet? It's mm. like just a little thing for people signing up to the email list. And I'm like, maybe yeah. I can use that short story yeah. um, because otherwise they have to pay for the whole anthology. So I contacted right. the editor and said, do you mind if I do that? I know it's not technically within the contract yet. And they're like, yeah. sure, just make sure you put a link in to where they can buy the full anthology. So yeah. we both nice. get something out of that interchange. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I was mm. going to say, so, and and um, I am in the process of, I haven't talked much about this. In fact, I maybe have only hinted at it on the podcast so far, but um, I'm... 
signed up with a program called Ammo. Uh, I don't remember the full thing, and that makes it sound so like um, violent. It's not at all that way, but uh, the the guy who designed it um, was an author for Amazon. Uh, and at one point, Amazon decided they weren't going to give him some of his royalties because there was some sort of dispute. Uh, and that mm. upset him, obviously. So he started looking into self-fulfilling author copies of his books. And he has a background in tech and just really like dug deep into all the different processes of how you can successfully advertise your way to a, a bigger mm. audience. Uh, yes. And so it, it's it's. Ammo Foundations, I think it's called. Lars Emmerich is is his author name. Um, mm. It's been really fun. It, it's funny because it's expensive. It's quite expensive. When you talk about being part of the program, um, it's a couple grand. And then all of the different things that you have to put together to s- get your book out there into the world. The reason I mention all this is you talked about that lead magnet. Um, mm. And I, I saw all of your book covers and I thought, you're actually a perfect candidate for uh, this program. And then you talked about being kind of like shorter on funds. And I was like, well, that's, you can't, you can't do anything about that, that piece of it. Mm. So, um, but it is theoretically a really cool way. And I guess one thing I'm interested to hear from you too. I find that after a year of doing a podcast, a year of really digging into marketing, those are things that I love, but I miss being a writer and a reader. I was thinking back to a couple of Christmases ago. In fact, I was seeing a post on Facebook that I had up of me sitting in uh, the armchair with my dog on my lap and a book. And I was like, I haven't done that in in years. Um, Mm -hmm. There's just Mm -hmm. too much going on. And I kind of, I kind of miss it a little bit. And so I was like, if I could, if I could figure out how to do a little bit less than I'm doing right now so that I could get back those moments of just kind of quiet reading and and enjoyment, that would be nice. Um, Mm. Do you feel like you have that with what you're doing? Because it does seem like you trade money for time or time for money. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to do launch this project with zero budget, but I am. I know very, you are. And I'm sorry if yeah, I invite that. No, 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 no. I'm, I, I'll even state it like outright. It's $2,000 is like my whole budget yeah. of which I've probably spent $500 on like Adobe licenses and website hosting, all that kind of stuff. I was okay. lucky. I have a friend who just did a web design course who put my website together. Awesome. Um, and she, she read all of my drafts, like including like full rewrites of mm-hmm. novellas where I like, I can't edit this to where I want it to be. I just have to start again. Um, yeah. amazingly generous friend. Uh, but yeah, that, that remaining money, I have to s- spend it strategically. Of course. I think, it, I think it's very easy to pour a huge amount of money in one particular channel, uh, yeah. only for it to never have a chance of going anywhere. Um, yeah. It, it, a good example of that, I wanted to ask you about this. So I think audiobooks are really like the hot thing yeah. at the moment. The, um, yeah. But I'm like, how can I get the maximum benefit from that in an advertising sense rather yeah. than a product sense? So the plan is I found a voice actor that I really love. Mm. Um, she's agreed to record the first five chapters of book one. Oh, nice. And I'm planning on releasing it on YouTube for free because wow. it ends on a cliffhanger that people who have enjoyed it up to that point would be like, well, I now got to go and buy the ebook to finish the story. Yes. So have you seen people use audiobooks that way? I've as- never I've never seen it used that way before. And I think it's a really good idea. I will also tip you off to the Amazon uh the the um good grief, their their audiobook audible program. They hmm. have uh readers who will read your book for an exchange of sales and they have to be part of that program. But my friend, mm-hmm. William Gray, I don't know if you listen to the podcast normally. He was one of my guests. He wrote the the man behind the door. I mm-hmm. fell so hard in love with that book and it never would have happened except for that. He reached out to me and said, Hey, I have an audio book. I'd like to share with you if you're interested. And I was kind of mm-hmm. like, yeah, a time crunched person who likes to uh, track his stats. Audiobook's a perfect fit for taking a, a, mm. a flyer on somebody. And I listened to the book and the reader actually is what, re- like immediately I heard the reader and I was like, well, this is super high quality. What in the world? Yeah. So yeah. I'm listening and it just grabbed me. And then the story sucked me in. It was such a good story. Uh, mm. And so from there, yeah, I just have been a huge advocate for him. Um, and you could look into doing that as well. You could supplement mm. Or, you know, figure out a way to, if that uh, reader that you really like 
would do something similar. You could share royalties. Um, but yes, audio is the future. In fact, mm. I think there's a possibility, as much as I hate to say this, that the majority of reading in the next couple of years is all going to be audio. Mm, mm. Well, we'll see, this is the thing, like only doing five chapters, the price is really low. My partner yeah. has a history as an audio um, engineer, so he can do the mastering. Mm. Yeah. Um, that makes life really, uh, you know, I'm just looking for leveraging all the things I've got Absolutely. on the hand. And if I put that out and it takes off and people love it, I can reinvest the money that I'm like making through sales back into doing the full audiobook and turn it yes. into a product. But yeah. it allows me to just put my toe in the water without, you know, blowing my budget. Yeah, I think I think that that's a really great way to go. And I like the way that you're thinking. Obviously, it doesn't matter whether I like the way you're thinking or not, but I'm just I guess I'm, I'm validating that the way you're thinking makes a lot of sense to me. And especially now, I used to be so focused on making a list and I still want to like that's a desire of mine because I do have a, an ego and a fairly large ego and I believe mm. that my writing is great and so I want sales to validate what I believe to be true as one version mm. of validating that um, but now more than ever and starting with your recommendation that I check out the the soul events I start to see this as a stair-stepping game when mm. is the point when I can just break even on this book take a breath and figure out the next step forward do you know the analogy or the metaphor that I'm using? Um, so, have you ever built like a campfire, like a bonfire? Mm -hmm. So, if you've only got like this huge log, you could <laughs> yeah. actually get that to catch fire, but you'd have to like pour a huge amount of petrol on it to yeah. get that little spark to translate onto that scale. Um, the, the proper way to do it is that little tiny spark goes onto a few tiny little fibers and then onto a few little twigs and then onto some bigger yeah. twigs. And you have to build that momentum to gradually get everything burning. Yeah. And th that's the way I'm looking at it. I've only got like a few twigs and, and a few sparks mm. on hand. Um, but if I, if I take it step by step, I, I yeah. can get there. Yeah. Think about too, this is the crazy part about the bonfire is that, um, that analogy either does account for or or misses all of the different things that don't feel related. Your time on Twitter, my time on Twitter. Um, I don't know exactly yet how you and I are going to in the future benefit each other. You've already benefited me greatly. Hopefully I get to repay the favor. Um, oh, just this is just this is such a great start. Yeah. And 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 that way that we interact and build connections. But I I I never thought that Twitter was going to be a one of my favorite places to be, but be mm. so important to my career. And it mm. has been vital. And that's the part of the bonfire where it's it's almost like um, I'm trying to run with your analogy. So maybe I'll abandon it. Mm. But it's, it's kind of like the <laughs> gathering of the correct fibers, the correct twigs, you know, not getting wet mm. twigs or that experiment of like these twigs are not good for catching quickly. Um, mm. And that's what's happening. There's so much of what we're doing that we don't know is leading to the building of the bonfire so that unfortunately we're so blind that one day we think we have nothing. And then we wake up the next day and our book has sold 5,000 copies overnight. I mean, that's, that's mm. the difference of what could happen yeah. and does for some Absolutely. people, you know? And when you think about it, yeah, I love, I love how your face just changed because it's the same thing that happens <laughs> in my heart too. You're kind of like, you, you can visualize that moment. You're like, please, I need it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, now, there was one other odd thing that I'm thinking of doing, and you may or maybe someone listening can tell me. I've, I've looked and I can't find any guidance on this. So, with the ebooks, I plan to release them at a relatively low price mm -hmm. and to, to bump that price up in regular intervals. But I want to mm. be explicit about that in the product description. So, yeah. does Amazon allow you to do that, saying that the price will be increasing at this Right until it becomes like a fair price, because no. I want to reward early mm -hmm. adopters, yeah. and I want to give people an incentive to buy this week rather than next week. Yeah, and the the whole like, oh no, it's suddenly on sale, and you know all the advertising that has to go with that, and the panic mm -hmm. that people are like, oh, I have to buy it now. It's a few dollars yeah. either way. Like people don't. Right. It's the time commitment for reading it, which I think is more significant mm -hmm. for most potential buyers. Yeah. Um, so yeah, how, do do you know if you can actually outline what you're price pricing strategy is in your product description Not, or will Amazon well, like ban that's that? A, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that specific question because that's a different angle at it than I might've considered, but um, you probably could in your product description. And I don't think Amazon would ban it. Uh, 
it's a question of how noisy it is for the person who's kind of browsing your product. What mm. I was really thinking and what I think might work exceptionally well for you since you have all of the books now and talk to me about this too, because I'm literally mm. spitballing at this moment. Mm -hmm. Since you have all of the books already written, you have the covers for all of the books, there may be a benefit in doing a bundling kind of a process. And mm -hmm. you can buy the first book. I don't know what low price is for you, but you could buy the first book, say, for $3.99. Um, mm -hmm. Or you could buy the entire series for $9.99. Mm -hmm. Is it five books? Am I remembering right, or six? Uh, it's it's four. It's four. Four. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yes, wrong. Yeah, it was five. It was five covers because one of the covers is for the bundle for the for the whole series. Perfect. Okay, yeah. there you go. All right. So I did I, kind of remember right. I just didn't mm -hmm. put it all together in my brain correctly. So I, I, I do have another weird strategy for the bundling yeah. as well. Okay. Yeah. So the the aim is once I've got the ebooks out and I've got like time to deal with the logistics for the first time. Uh, and I've, if I'm getting enough interest to bundle them together as a paperback, because mm -hmm. for novellas, it'll end up being about 160,000 words. It's like a, a yeah. long novel, but it's, it, it'll fit yeah. within, within a book. Um, but I want to price the combined four paperback version lower than buying the four individual ebooks. And you don't normally yes. see that. Normally the ebooks are cheaper than yeah. the paperback. The reason why I'm doing that is. A physical book is itself a marketing device because yes. people tend to give them to their friends after they've right. read them. Whereas ebooks yeah. die on the device that they're downloaded onto um, if they don't start being pirated and sent everywhere for free. Yeah. Um, so as an early career author, that seems like uh, a smart move because it gets physical copies mm -hmm. of my book spread out all over the world and pass, pass from hand to hand. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that strategy. Yeah, and I, I don't want to create noise for you. So uh, mm. I'll, I'll send you the MP3 for this sooner than I would normally, just the full conversation so you can reflect on it. I mm. think your strategy would better be served by uh, publishing those books on Web3 as mm -hmm. ebooks, and then the fifth one is a bundle for Web3. Um, mm -hmm. So there are five distinct products that are on the blockchain. And minting a rather small number of them so that you make sure they all get scooped up. Because the, the trick with Web3 is that if you don't sell your entire minted collection pretty quickly, then the mm -hmm. secondary market takes over and you never move those final copies. So they yep. lose value yep. instead of having value. Yep. But I think there's a, a, a company that I've been talking to for quite a while. Um, and I had Julia on my podcast, but it, it was right when we changed kind of themes. So her episode is still waiting for a bonus episode release. Um, it's called Riedel. Uh, and they're at readle.co. So it's R E A D L dot co. Uh, you would be a perfect candidate for them. I have to think more. So we'll talk offline about the number of copies that you might want to mint. Mm -hmm. But if you did it correctly, that would be a wonderful spot to reach possibly a sympathetic audience as well. I don't, I don't know how hand in hand tech and biology are, but my sense is, is that there is a, a sympathetic connection there that might be um, not not in the negative form of the word exploit, but uh, you could exploit <laughs> that connection. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I, I wondered about that if the um, the kind of transhumanist circles in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. could take an interest in this work because I haven't yeah. seen anyone do purely biological science fiction before. The yeah. like all of the the usual stuff we think of as science and technology is stripped away what if you're just left with biology that's the yeah. i've looked and looked and looked and i'm sure that there's some like you know golden age stories out there that were you know forgotten decades ago that some yeah. sci-fi nerd will be able to point me towards but uh yeah in, in recent history i haven't seen it done yeah yeah so my my sense is look into i think that you you might find something great in uh, the Web3 area. Riedel's a good spark, spot to start. Um, Julia would definitely love to know I sent you her way. They're working really hard to build their their company right now. So I think that they're especially open for collaborative relationships. Um, and then, so I think that that maybe answers some of the question of ways to mint a product that becomes, uh, it, it, like you mentioned, the audiobook then just becomes a dead thing on somebody's device as soon as they buy it. I've always had a mm. bit of an issue with that and with Amazon there. Um, and then the next question is, can you move people away from Amazon by actually anchoring your prices a little bit higher? And would it mm -hmm. be worth setting up a store on the side to direct people toward? That's another question we probably take offline to a certain degree. Um, yes, but yeah. 
one of the things that I'm doing right now is setting up a Shopify uh, store for my books where I can offer mm-hmm. you the best possible price because I get to keep the rest of the royalties. Yes. Yeah. So that might be worth something to people. And that would enable you with that that physical book as well to do some things that you might not otherwise be able to do mm. cost wise. So, yeah, it's it, it, it's definitely something I feel like you have to uh, work towards. Like, I, yeah, often like through this process of self-publishing and self-promotion, I felt this pressure to like make everything line up on the on the one day and be and be perfect. I know. And I've realized that's probably going to make me hate <laughs> the, the process if I don't just flub yeah. it anyway. Um, so I'm trying to be strategic about what I do invest my energy in for this project because I have other projects planned in the future. Like I've got yeah. other novellas already outlined. I just have to draft and edit them. This is why I love novellas. Like I can draft it in a month. Yeah. It's just amazing. It's just, it's just completely, if I was doing like full length no- novels, it just mm-hmm. blows out of proportion. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And they're books that are more obviously sci-fi, like they're mm-hmm. a space adventure and an AI yeah. one. Um, with my own dark kind of twist on things, uh, so so very on brand, but still a bit more accessible. Whereas this first project was a passion project. It's a story that's been rattling around in my head for years and years and years, and just wouldn't leave me alone. I couldn't find it anywhere on the market, anything like it. So I'm like, I just guess I have to have sit to down write and write it. it now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but because it's such a a weird non-existent subgenre, it yeah. may or may not take off. Uh, it, it's a it's a bigger risk. But my yeah. my goals with writing and getting out these particular books is to learn the ropes to become mm-hmm. a better writer and come out the end of the process wanting to do it all over again. Because yeah. I think a lot of people burn themselves out on their first attempt and yeah. they're like, oh, that was a nightmare. I never, never want to think about writing <laughs> ever again. It's too horrible. Yeah, you're right. And I I think that that's been, I've experienced small elements of that along this process is like every time I think I've cracked the code, (laughs) you know, you, you try something like this is brand new uh, and it's, it's bound to work and it doesn't work. And you try a new thing and it doesn't work. And every new thing that you try, like eventually you're tired. And Mm. uh, I mean, I'd share with you that I just decided to publish the ebook of my novel uh, that has been in the works for for eight years now um mm-hmm. and i sent it out to my Substack uh subscribers which is a fairly small but also fairly loyal group of people um and so i kind of was thinking i will probably get a hundred takers to pick up a free copy of the ebook um mm-hmm. and and be happy to read it and and review it in time and uh, as of the time that we hopped on this call uh, i'd moved eight of them <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> so every time you think something is is bound to work, and I know that the cover art is beautiful, so I'm not I'm not concerned about that. It could be some issue with the synopsis or something, but it's a great novel. I I am so like I said, I'm so confident, and it's okay. We're trying a lot of things. We are putting a lot of energy into a lot of different avenues, and um, few of them work like a magic bullet. It seems to be. Uh, Enough. And particularly with marketing in this day and age, it's a moving target. Yeah. So, like, you can have amazing success with TikTok one year and do exactly the same thing a year or two later and yeah. the ecosystem's moved on. Yes. So, yeah, I, I don't think there's any, uh, there's no recipe for success. You, you have to be constantly trying different yeah. things. Yeah, I've noticed Which that, is fun. Uh, it's exciting. It's it, like you get to play around with it. Love the positivity. <laughs> <laughs> you're catching me. You're catching me at an ultimate nadir of, of just frustration, I guess. <laughs> like it's I, not I, fun I, anymore. <laughs> it, it's an attitude I picked up from my experimental farming, oddly enough. Yeah. So like I would plant, you know, 50 different kinds of heirloom tomatoes mm-hmm. and then refuse to water them, refuse to put any fertilizer on them. Oh uh, no, a little bit of my own home grade fertilizer, no pest control, and just basically yeah. watch to see what happens. And if you're if your only aim is to maximize the amount of tomatoes you get, it's a terrible, terrible strategy. But yeah. I end up finding that one variety out of 50 that loves my conditions, doesn't mm-hmm. care if I knock it around and still produces a, a an end result that I enjoy. Yeah. And once you get through that early difficult stage, you can keep growing that better variety. Like you can make that your speciality. Mm. But if if you don't go through that early painful stage, you, you never have an opportunity to find out where the strength really lies. And my wife is, she loves growing plants. So we have, our house is just full of 
house plants. <laughs> and uh, there's a few. She's like, uh, she hates air plants. Uh, I'm sure you're mm-hmm. familiar with all these things. She hates them. She's oh, like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Can't, she can't get them to thrive no matter what she does. And uh, then she has this jade plant. And, and everywhere you read online, jade plants are are kind of finicky. They're slow to grow. They can't do anything. Mm-hmm. And her jade plant in two years has like quadrupled in size. It's just an amazing plant see, and, uh, see this is the thing though you could move to a different location and mm-hmm. suddenly the air plants you can't kill and the jade plants you can't keep alive right so it, it's embracing that situational kind of moment and running with what works yeah. and unless you try both plants you're never going to find out which one is the one for you yeah there's such huge implications in this conversation that have nothing to do with writing. Like um, supposing, <laughs> supposing that you like <laughs> plants that had certain properties that maybe slightly altered your, your way of thinking about the world. And you live in a place where none of those plants grow native. Does that mean mm-hmm. that the people and the animals and like the, all the flora and fauna are just not meant to have an altered mindset? Like, does that mean that if you Possibly. live in a place? Yeah, that's that's an well, interesting. It, it's an interesting tidbit of history that uh, golden ages in China, the Middle East, and then the Renaissance in Europe all coincided with the mass consumption of caffeine. Uh, yeah, <laughs> mm. yeah, so, exactly. yeah. There's a there's a kind of mania that you need to sit down and like you know write a a, a magnum opus. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. If you're not caffeinated, it's it's just so much more difficult to do. Yeah, I loved Michael Pollan. He wrote uh, the that book about those, and he talks about caffeine specifically. And he's like, even bees seek out caffeinated plants. Like, there's mm. there's almost a directive in busy body <laughs> kind of animals to find the caffeine. <laughs> so, uh, there, I'm I'm one of these rare writers that if I consume caffeine, I go completely nuts, and I just play repetitive video games and like get nothing uh, done. Okay. So I'm I'm already like wired enough. Like that's my yeah. base level. <laughs> yeah. Definitely not me. I'm a morning person. I do I enjoy so much uh the earliest part of the morning. And it feels like it's literally all downhill from five thirty AM until the end of the day. I'm I'm super sharp and creative and engaged. Can I and then, can I share yeah. the the writing technique, writing method trick? that has worked the best for me that I've never seen anyone explain. So I'm a big believer in um, how much happens on the subconscious level with creativity. Mm -hmm. And I decided to try tapping into that. So my routine when I'm drafting is right before I go to bed, I read the outline for the next day's drafting. Mm. And as I'm going to sleep, I'm like kind of turning it over in my head and I wake up in the morning, like just ready to go. Like it's, it's like I've been chewing on it for like eight hours overnight yeah. So, I mean, what better way to like take to, to use hours in the day that you otherwise couldn't be writing? Yeah. Um, Do you so, feel like yeah, has it, it ever it, disrupted your sleep? Has it ever like so much been on your mind that you're struggling uh, to sleep at all? Or I, I usually take a bit of time to get to sleep. Uh, mm-hmm. Occasionally, I'll wake up at like three in the morning and I have to get up and write something down. Yeah. Uh, that that's pretty rare. Um, mm-hmm. Probably uh, no. I, I sleep pretty soundly these days. Maybe it's the, the lack of caffeine. Like most people can't relate on that level. Um, but one thing that was really interesting, um, I, I wrote this story twice in mm-hmm. novel form from the main character's point of view. Okay, and it just didn't work. It just didn't work. I, I suspected the main character was too unsympathetic for like modern audiences. He's just got all of these horrible flaws, and. Um, yeah, I tried it twice, just wasn't working. And yeah. then I caught COVID. Um, I think it was COVID. I didn't end up getting diagnosed, but it, sure. it matched all the symptoms. And I had this horrible fever dream where uh, I like tapped into that altered mind state to wow. restructure the whole thing. So yeah. it's a bit of an unusual structure. The four novellas, each one is from a different point of view, mm-hmm. but that main character features as a secondary character passing through their lives. Oh, wow. So the main character still connects the whole story together. Interesting. But they're, they're like the, the second or third most important character in yeah. that particular installment. I and love um, yeah, I, I really love analyzing story structure. Um, Mm -hmm. One of the things I was thinking about creating as a self-promotion tool was a YouTube channel that analyzes story structure in like an infographic kind of format, like Mm -hmm. take a whole novel and compact it down into a like a kind of graph that people can look at in five or 10 minutes, which, yeah, um, yeah, but yeah, I I started doing that. And then I made myself read a few novels that I otherwise would have put down like a third of the way in. Yeah. Um, I, I, I love 
starting and not finishing novels. <laughs> I'm not one of these people who has to complete something. And yep. yeah, it was torture, like taking notes on something where I'm like, oh, this is awful. And <laughs> um, and I realized I would probably be mostly marketing to writers yeah. um, who I think are probably the, the worst people oh. to market a book to because they're already doing so much and yes. reading so much. Right. Um, people who... Uh, are avid readers are the second worst because they have a to-read list that's like 50 books long and your chance of oh, getting to position number one is really, really slim. Um, yeah. but my target audience for these particular novellas, uh, which I think you might find interesting, are people who are, I think the term in the US is doomers, like they kind of think civilization is is yeah. on its way out as we, as we know it. Yep. And they're often people who grew up reading science fiction but the Star Trek kind of worlds became silly mm. when they realized that, like, we're, we're kind of running out of resources to keep the lights on. Yeah. Um, and they often got into apocalyptic fiction for a while, but that gets boring. Like, yeah. you just turn on the news and it's, right. <laughs> you can get it there. Yeah. So I'm like, that's an audience with a pent up demand. Like, they're people who would read mm. a novel in that genre, but they've lost yeah. the taste for it because of specific reasons that my books can get around because they offer an alternative vision of the future for people who are interested in where society is going. Yeah, that's fascinating. Mm. Well, um, I mean, look at look at Harry Potter. Like, the reason why it was so successful is that people who would never read a novel picked that up and read it. Yeah, right. And that made it like orders of magnitude. A uh, greater potential audience than mm-hmm. a book that's marketed specifically at at readers at yeah. the people who habitually read. Yeah, not yeah, that I expect I, it's going to be a Harry no, Potter. No, no, I'm, I'm fully I'm not hearing sure I'd you. Want it. <laughs> oh, really? I would, I would, uh, I would die for that. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I, I success comes with a, a price attached to it. I mean, look at, at Rowling's life. Like she. She has a pretty strange existence at the moment. Yeah, I would I would love to know. Um, I can't speak informedly about uh, her opinions or how just or unjust uh, her portrayal is. But my sense is, um, yeah, that it came so fast at her that she tried to respond. Because I remember that, that at one point she said Albus Dumbledore was gay, but there was no evidence necessarily <laughs> in the books that he was gay. And there was mm-hmm. there was a lot of different things she she tried to do. And I think her original intent was to appeal to everybody. She loved the mass appeal she'd gotten and she wanted not to alienate any of her audience. And when you have an audience mm-hmm. of a billion people, like, what do you do? Um, yeah. And then yeah. at the moment when I think she maybe got a little bit fatigued from it all, she starts to to speak to something that maybe has been ruminating on her mind. And it's like, hey, I'm a woman and I want to feel sacred. I'm, by the way, I'm 100 percent just thinking aloud at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, she's like, I'm a, I'm a woman and I feel like there's something sacred about being a woman. And she tried to voice that without really thinking through the implications and the consequences were way bigger because of how big she was. So yes, there's huge consequences in being famous, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, she's sitting on a billion dollars and the reality that you'll never be able to take away that she's changed millions, many millions of children's lives and many millions of adults lives in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Harry Potter Mm -hmm. undeniably left a positive imprint on my life, on my son Silas's life um, and many people that I've met. You can't take mm. that away from her. So it's like take mm. the good and the bad. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take her existence right now. I, I think I think I have to learn the um uh, the long lost art of keeping my mouth shut. Because <laughs> I mean <laughs> social Don't media is designed. <laughs> yeah, well uh, no, this kind of thing is fine because it's a conversation, but the, yeah. the short form social media is yeah. designed to blow up. Like it, it is it is mm-hmm. built on reaction yes. and yep. controversy. And yep. particularly because the themes in my book, it's like biology is like sex and reproduction, yeah, genetic engineering, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and race, and it, it just all of this kind of stuff uh, is there, and it's explored in kind of grey area kind of ways. Mm-hmm. So I fully expect to have people coming for my head at some point, and yeah, I, I'm that's fun. I love engaging with those kind of things, and I mm-hmm. think I have to learn to just not like the book speaks for itself yeah and write another book rather than respond on social media what you what you're saying i think is is both very true and really difficult Uh, my my agent my former agent and i discussed 
in part one of the novel that I just released, uh, there's a, a fairly graphic rape scene and it's absolutely critical to the story. Um, mm. and rape is a reality. I would never base a whole book on it, but to have it be kind of a, a fulcrum for a story, I think is important. And I just know that people are going mm. to call me names when they read it. There's going to be a portion of people mm-hmm. who say that it's exploitative and awful and it shouldn't be in a book and all of the different things. And that will be a moment. If someone says it the right way, if they spin it the right way, it'll be really hard to be quiet. Mm. I don't know. So, oh, it, 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 yeah. For comparison, uh, my first book has a sex scene in it that could be rape, ah. could not. Like the issue of uh-huh. consent. Like it, I love morally gray situations where Likewise. it's not obvious. It, and like real life is like that. There's, there's a lot of yes. uh, incidents that happen where people will disagree on yeah. where you know they uh, where they place responsibility. Yeah, how how our memory works too. In a moment, maybe, uh, and and again, I mean, like, golly, we've really gotten into some hot topic issues here. But you know, <laughs> there's there's a moment where it, your memory is that you're consenting, and then there's a moment later where you look back and there's all kinds of regret, and you're like, I didn't, I didn't consent to this. I think even mm. memory can change things. Uh, I'm always going to side with the vulnerable in those cases, and that's I think mm-hmm. a, a place that I'm pretty pretty comfortable being. I'm looking at the time, and unfortunately, I have my children's wrestling meet coming up here, um, which I'm really sorry that I didn't do a better job of paying attention to my calendar because I could probably talk to you for another hour and it would be profitable for both of us. But I'm going to cut us off for for the time being. The most important thing is is let people know where they can find you. You're not using a, a pen name to uh, hide who you are. You're just doing it for cleanliness so that you can kind of keep yes. Shane and, and, and Haldane separate. Okay. So where do you want people to find you when they want to get these novellas? Uh, so uh, easiest place is uh, through my website, haldanebdoyle.com, where you can sign up to my monthly email list. Uh, each email will include a little illustrated tidbit of bizarre biology that you'll never see David Attenborough talk about, uh, <laughs> just to give you a reason to open the damn thing and, and stay subscribed. Um, I'm very interested in finding ARC readers. So if you would like to read book one for free in return for an honest review, um, just let me know when you sign up for the email and uh, I will be in, in forever in your debt. <laughs> awesome. That sounds good. Send mm. send me one for sure. I would love to. Mm. And I will make time for it, even though I won't be able to log it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll definitely send you the um, the audio version as well, too, when it comes together. Thank you for listening to TRBM. The theme music was provided by the ever-talented Christopher Talon. And hey, if you liked what you heard, share this show with other readers, because what's the point of telling stories if nobody's listening? <laughs>